May the 4th be with you, everyone. My name is Ryan Cam, and welcome to my review for Star Wars Episode One: The Phantom Menace. This movie was directed by George Lucas. It was released in 1999, and it starred Liam Neeson, Ewan McGregor, Natalie Portman, and Jake Lloyd, just to name a few. Welcome to my series of Star Wars reviews leading up to Episode Nine: The Rise of Skywalker. Uh, the order for these reviews are going to go like this. I'm going to review Episode 1, Episode 2, The Clone Wars movie, which was released in theaters and is a part of the canon, Episode 3, Solo, Rogue One, and then 4, 5, 6, and then Force Awakens, Last Jedi, because even though I reviewed The Last Jedi, I want to make another video talking about it and if that movie still holds up in my mind despite that initial review, and then eventually Rise of Skywalker when that comes out. So with all of that in mind, let's dive into episode one, because I've been looking for a half-decent excuse to talk about The Phantom Menace for quite some time now. Episode one has always held kind of a special place in my heart. Um, let me just sit up here. Uh, in terms of Star Wars itself, my fandom kind of started with episode one. Let me show you something. This is the Episode 1 Phantom Menace DVD. I'll... Jeez, they had to text me again? I've watched this DVD so many times. I think it still even has, like, scratches and scuffs on there from how much it's been played. You know, in reality, I, um, think I may have to clean this off. I'll clean it off later. But I remember it vividly. One day, my dad came home, and he got... and he brought the six Star Wars movies in this box set. I don't have the box set right now. They, the discs were all split up, and, and I still have the original trilogy in the box set, but uh, the prequels were, the boxes to the prequels were eventually thrown out, and all I have left are the discs. But he brought it home, and I was just so excited. I watched episode one just right away. But now that I've grown up and that I'm a lot older and I've matured in many respects, I've learned that Episode 1 still has a fair amount of people that just kind of crap on it just for the sake of it's not what they want in Star Wars and so they're just going to crap on it for no reason. I can say this because I was guilty of it as well. I pretty much went through the five steps of grief when it comes to The Phantom Menace, and the entire prequel trilogy now that I think about it. No, no, you people are crazy! Episode 1 is a great movie! I mean, it's got beautiful visual effects, it's got great music, the acting is all spot on. I mean, Jar Jar. He's freaking hysterical, man. Like, what is wrong with you? I just watched it again. And now I hate it, for all the reasons that I once said that I liked it. This is me with my arms crossed. Well, you know, I mean, with the benefit of hindsight, I mean, it, it's not too horrible. I mean, there are certainly worse movies out there. I mean, it, it, I mean, I, there, it's not perfect, but I mean, at the same time, I mean, I used to like it as a kid. I mean, I, I'm gonna watch it again just to be sure. Oh god, I just watched 35 reviews on YouTube saying that The Phantom Menace was horrible. I mean, hey, what is my life? You know what? The Phantom Menace is okay. It's got its problems, but at the same time, I do respect a lot of the choices that they made. Some of the choices they made were kind of stupid. All in all, I respect that they put a lot of effort into it, and... It's, 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 it's good. It's not bad. It's not amazing either. It's just good. I went through those five stages of grief quite a bit. And now I'm at the point of acceptance when it comes to The Phantom Menace. It's not a perfect movie. It does have problems. But for me personally, I respect why George Lucas made a lot of the choices that he made in terms of story, in terms of character, in terms of direction. I respect a lot of the- I respect this movie in a lot of ways. I don't like it in a lot of ways, which I'll get into in one second, but overall, I think The Phantom Menace is just good. I- I tend to watch it, like, at least once a year, and every time I'm like, I cringe at the bad stuff and I cheer at the great stuff. But for now, let's just get into the actual movie itself. 
In many ways, Episode 1 is lost on people immediately after they read the opening crawl, which reads, Turmoil has engulfed the Galactic Republic. The taxation of trade routes to outlying star systems is in dispute. If you understand the politics to a certain degree, you can understand why, in a way, it was kind of easy for Emperor Palpatine and the Sith to kind of take over. Like, if you really peek beneath the layers, you can see that basically Emperor Palpatine was like Francis Underwood from House of Cards. He played multiple sides against each other, turned on each one of them, laid out everything, and then at the end of the day, built the world in his own image. In many ways, Emperor Palpatine is one of my favorite villains in movie history because he's not just, you know, he's not just an old guy who, like, throws around force lightning. You know, he's cerebral. He thinks this stuff out. The politics in The Phantom Menace, I really don't have a problem with. I mean, in terms of the actual talking about it stuff, I mean, yeah, it can get kind of boring, but if you actually pay attention to it, it's actually quite important to not only The Phantom Menace, but to the prequel trilogy in general. In any case, the opening scene of the movie is Qui-Gon Jinn and Obi-Wan Kenobi, played by Liam Neeson and Ewan McGregor respectively, going on to the Trade Federation ship, led by Newt Gunray, to basically say, Hey, Trade Federation, what are you doing in the system that you don't belong? Quick side road to talk about Liam Neeson and Ewan McGregor. I think Liam Neeson gets a bad rap, especially in terms of his role in this movie. I think Qui-Gon Jinn is one of the most underrated characters in all of Star Wars because he's only in it for one movie and yet we almost know nothing about him. You have to dive into like the comics and the extended lore, the stuff that's in canon at least, to kind of understand why he kind of does the way, the things that he does. The movie drops hints that he's kind of on the outs with the Jedi Order. Like, he's a part of it, but at the same time, he's kind of out of it too. There's a scene where he and Obi-Wan are talking on a, on a rooftop on Coruscant, and Obi-Wan drops the line of, Don't anger the council, council master, not again. And I'm like, anger the council? How did this happen? I think the anger towards Qui-Gon Jinn comes from Liam Neeson himself. Like, he's not everybody's cup of tea, and I get that. But I think that Qui-Gon Jinn is a pretty cool character. They should have done more with him. I respect why they didn't. But at the same time, I don't hate him. I actually kind of like him. And now let's talk about Obi-Wan Kenobi, played by Ewan McGregor. Ewan McGregor is the best damn thing in this entire trilogy. In terms of capturing the essence of Obi-Wan, played by the magnificent Sir Alec Guinness, and making the role, in many ways, his own, McGregor does a fantastic job at both. And the chemistry between Qui-Gon and Obi-Wan is quite good. You can kind of see that Qui-Gon has a bit of a new wave of thinking, and Obi-Wan is more of a traditional Jedi Order thinking. And the two constantly kind of do this with each other. And it's pretty interesting to watch. But the negotiations with the Trade Federation do not go well at all. There's a big battle with droids, and, J and Qui-Gon and Obi-Wan have to go down to the planet Naboo in order to stop the Trade Federation's invasion of the planet. And now we get into easily the most hated part of this entire movie, Jar Jar Binks. Now, I'm not going to try and defend this character, but I'm also not going to try and insult it, because every insult and death threat could, that could possibly be leveled at this thing has, quite frankly, already been done. Like, anything that I could say about this character, quite frankly, is like adding lighter fluid to a wildfire. I mean, it could add something, but then again, the fire's already burning, so what's the point? My one complaint about Jar Jar is that he kind of does nothing. Like, think about it. What does he do that is not an accident? I will wait. He doesn't do anything, right? 
even when he's a Gungan general, he's pretty much useless. Like, MacArthur, he ain't, alright? Is he insulting to the intelligence? I mean, I guess. I mean, is he, is he offensive to some people? I could see that, sure. But my biggest problem with Jar Jar is that he is just there to fall over stuff and then step in crap. Like, he's easily the worst part of the movie, like, by a country mile. But at the same time, I don't fault the man behind the character or, or just the general nature of Jar Jar itself. It was just the direction of this character that irked me. But long story short, Qui-Gon saves saves Jar Jar, and Jar Jar takes him to the Gungan City. And for 1999 CGI, it still holds up in many respects. It doesn't totally hold up, but it's still industrial light and magic, and even when it doesn't look good, it at least looks really cool. And the Gungan City looks really cool. And when the trio are taken to, I guess, the Gungan King, you see Qui-Gon pull off some really cool Jedi mind tricks. And that's why I love Qui-Gon, because he, his moral compass, I guess you could call it, is a little more malleable than other Jedi. I mean, he follows the Jedi Order to at least some degree, but he doesn't just use it for the sake of, you know, being a pacifist. If he wants to use it, he chooses to use it. Like, he tells the Gungan King, we need transport, and the Gungan King's like, hey, you've got transport. But another cool Qui-Gon trait that many people pass over is compassion. It would have been so easy for Qui-Gon to just say, yeah, Jar Jar's a menace, kill him. Because, you know, Jar Jar was kicked out of the Gungan city for being clumsy. But at the same time, Qui-Gon showed a little compassion. It's quite frankly a trait that isn't really shown in a ton of Jedi, and I appreciated that. But the, Jedi is, but the Jedi leave the Gungan City, they have to go through the planet core. There's always a big a fish. And they, re and they reach the Naboo city capital, where it has been taken over by the Trade Federation and their droids. And Queen Amidala has been taken hostage at this point, played by Natalie Portman. The Jedi save them, and they get, out, get off the planet. And before all that, they actually have a pretty funny scene where they all arrive at the, at the hangar where all the pilots are being held prisoner, and Qui-Gon's like, I'm with these two, we need to take them to Coruscant. And the, droid, and the droid's like, where are you taking them? And Qui-Gon's like, to Coruscant. And, and the droid's like, Coruscant, uh, uh, wait, that, that doesn't compute, uh, uh, you're under arrest. And then Qui-Gon slices them in half. Like, that was pretty funny. They eventually do get off the planet, uh, we meet R2-D2 for the first time, which, honestly, I found some complaints They were saying that, you know, when R2-D2 was introduced, and he was brought before the Queen, you know, they were, they looked down at him and he's like, R2-D2, your highness. People were complaining about that, I'm like, he's a droid, he would have an identification number on him somewhere. I mean, if you're going to introduce him in the prequels, like, introduce him here. You know, some of the complaints about Star Wars movies are just really dumb. Like, I don't think that the people making them are dumb. I am just think that they're connecting dots that don't exist. But the crew eventually have to go to Tatooine because their ship is damaged, and you kind of all know where this is heading, right? Qui-Gon, Padme, R2, and Jar Jar go into Mos Eisley Spaceport, they go into Watto's junk shop, which, you know, Watto's a pretty ugly design, but at the same time, he's a supporting character. He's not in the movie very much. I really don't have too many complaints about it, other than he kind of looks like Gonzo's, like, deadbeat older brother or something. And then we meet young Anakin Skywalker, played by Jake Lloyd. And just to get this part out of the way... Are you an angel? In terms of Jake Lloyd, I don't hate the kid. I'm 21 years old, I've got things going for me, plus I just don't have the time or the energy to hate on Jake Lloyd for something that he was involved in 20 years ago. I just don't care. I think in some universe there is a time where there is a great young Anakin performance. And unfortunately in Phantom Menace, this just wasn't it. 
I mean, Lloyd definitely tried, and there was there was emotion to him. You know, he had to get through some pretty heady material. Jake Lloyd basically tried. It, it's not Daniel Day-Lewis, but it's not Tommy Wiseau either. It was passable at best. And honestly, what's happened to Jake Lloyd in, in recent years is pretty sad, and I don't want to pile on top of him. So I'm just going to say Lloyd tried, he failed in some respects, he succeeded in others, and just let's move on. The situation is that they that Qui-Gon and all of them, they need parts for their ship and they don't have enough money to do it. So and so young Anakin says, Hey, I'm a pod racer, I'll win the pod race and I'll get you the money. So Qui-Gon makes a wager with Watto, and then we cut to the pod race scene. Which or actually, we need to talk about one other thing. Midichlorian. People were getting just so worked up over the midichlorians, like, for years now. People are still worked up about the midichlorians. And for me personally, I have no problem with them. I mean, the Force in certain ways has always been genetically transferred. I mean, why do all the Skywalkers have Force abilities? I mean, is it just chance or is it genetics? I say it's the latter. So, to say that Anakin is has more midichlorians than Yoda, I mean, that's fine. I mean, that's all fits into the Chosen One thing, and I personally don't mind it. Basically, in many regards, Anakin Skywalker is a prodigy. You know, no one can explain why he's good at the things he does, or how he just is. And people just get mad at that for some weird reason. But now that we touch on, on the midichlorians, let's go to the pod race scene. And I am one of the minority that says that I love the pod racing scene. Even by 2019 standards, it looks really good. Like, it's tense, it's action-filled, there isn't a really a dull moment. There's a really cool tense moment where one of the, one of the parts comes loose on Anakin's pod. Look, Anakin's pod is basically like like a teacup attached to two 747 jet engines. And, you know, one of the parts comes off and he has to catch it with like this magnet thing. He's like, eee. And I'm like, oh God, please get it, please get it, please get it. That's it, reattaches it. I'm like, yes. But throughout a thread line throughout the entire pod race is Anakin's rivalry with Sebulba. I've always liked Sebulba. You know, he looked really cool. He was a, just a sleazy alien, you know. He had the coolest pod of all the pod racers. He had basically a chariot with engines attached to it that looked like X's. And the sound design of his pod is just so cool. Whenever he turns a corner, it's like do 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 By the way, that was a Ferrari with a hole punched in the muffler. I learned that from the biggest Star Wars fan I will ever meet, Kyle. Shout out to you, Kyle. Long story short, Anakin wins the pod race and wins his freedom which leads to probably one of the most touching scenes, if not the most touching scene, in this entire movie. It's when Anakin has to leave his mom and pretty much the only home that he's ever known. It's a really good scene where, you know, where his mom is like, don't look back, don't look back, and John Williams' music is kicking on, and, and he's walking towards Qui-Gon, and he's like, man, this is really good. It's one of the few, like, really, really emotional, like, just prequel moments in general. It's, it's, a, it's a definite standout. But when Qui-Gon, Padme, and Anakin are on their way back to the ship, they are ambushed by Darth Maul. I'll talk more about Maul later on, but for, but for right now, let's say Maul attacks them, they have a pretty good lightsaber duel, and they get off the planet, thankfully alive. For now. And then our team heads back to Coruscant. And let's just talk about Coruscant for one second because I love Coruscant. I love the look of it. I love the design. It's, it's a planet that's just one big city. I mean, how cool is that? Honestly. But then they all land, they reunite with the Jedi Order, and we meet Chancellor Palpatine in person for the first time because you've seen him in holograms and other things. Chancellor pa uh, M Senator Palpatine, as he's now called, is played by Ian McDermott. And I've always liked Ian McDermott. I'll talk more about him as these reviews go along, but for right now, 
Ian McDermott is pretty cool, but let's keep going. Qui-Gon introduces Anakin to the Jedi Order, and the Jedi Order are really not big fans. Like, they, like when Qui-Gon is like, on our way back to our ship, we were attacked by a Sith Lord. The Jedi Order was like, the Sith have been gone for a millennia. I mean, the Sith are dead. And I'm thinking to myself, wait, I mean, like, Qui-Gon ain't making this up here. Which leads to one of the secretly really good through lines throughout not only The Phantom Menace, but the prequel trilogy itself. It really emphasizes that the Jedi are kinda either lazy or arrogant or maybe a combination of both. That they've been on top for so long that they couldn't possibly comprehend the Sith coming back in any way. Like, they thought that the fire was out. There couldn't be a spark. Like, it, it, it's done. But yet, here is Qui-Gon saying, I have, I was attacked by someone with Sith teachings. And the Jedi were like, no you weren't. Like, the Sith are dead. Basically, the whole Clone Wars were the Jedi's fault for not at least looking towards the future and understanding that, oh crap, we might be in trouble. And in a, be and in a bit of fast tracking that will more more than likely bite Obi-Wan in the butt later on, Qui-Gon's like, I want to take Anakin on as my, as my Padawan learner. And Obi-Wan, he's more than ready for the trials. Which, admittedly enough, turns out to be a big mistake later on in the prequels. I'll talk more about that in episode 2, but for right now, let's just keep trucking along. Queen Amidala shows up at the Senate meetings and she's like, Hey, my home is being invaded by, you know, by the Trade Federation over here. They're starving our people. Like, what the hell? And the Trade Federation's like, Hey, we did this by the book here. You know, it's not exactly like it's our fault. You know, you kind of cut us off. So we're kind of trying to do business here. And, and Chancellor Valorum, played by Terrence Stamp, by the way, he's all like, let's... Let's see if we can work this out. Let's try and make a treaty or something. And Queen Amidala's like, I did not come all this way to make a treaty. I call for a vote of no confidence in Chancellor Valorum. And it's right there where it's like, the politics are really important. Because earlier in the day, Ch Senator Palpatine is like, Chancellor Valorum just sits on his butt all day. I mean, coming here is pretty much a, few, is a fool's errand. And you can see that you can see the harvest starting to be planted, if you will, of Senator Palpatine eventually becoming emperor, and he, he's laying out the pieces, if you will. That's one of the reasons why I maintain that the politics is so important in episode one. Not executed well, but still important nonetheless. Queen Amidala then realizes she is sick of this crap, and she decides to go back to Naboo but with the Jedi in tow as well. They go back to Naboo, they make a peace treaty with the Gungans, because their reasoning is basically, hey, when the Sith kill us, they're gonna come back and kill you too. You know, we're all basically the enemy of my enemy is my friend here. And the two form an alliance. And the movie then splits off into four separate sections. Qui-Gon and Obi-Wan versus Darth Maul, the space battle with the Trade Federation, the ground battle, and and Padme Amidala and her guys trying to take out the take out the Viceroy. And while I believe each one serves a purpose, I think that the Qui Gon and Darth Qui Gon Obi Wan versus Darth Maul battle is just the best part of this entire movie. I'll sum up the rest of the parts like really quickly and then talk more about the uh, talk more about the lightsaber duel because I just love that part so much. But anyway, on the ground, uh, the Gungans face off against the droids. Jar Jar lucks his way to victory. I guess that's what you can say. In space, Anakin hijacks one of the ships and takes out one of the Trade Federation ships, which people found a problem with, but you know, he's he's a pilot. You know, he's pretty good at this stuff. You know, he's young, but he's pretty good at this stuff. Padme and her guys get get Viceroy get the Viceroy in a vulnerable position and he basically calls off the invasion. 
Now with that, all that out of the way, let's talk about the lightsaber duel because this is just c'est magnifique. Everything about this action scene is just wonderful. John Williams' awesome Duel of the Fates soundtrack. Uh, just the chemistry between, like, between the three. You know, the Jedi having to basically play off the back foot while Darth Maul is basically on the offensive with his, with his double saber. Which, by the way, when I saw that the first time, I, my jaw dropped because he whips that out and he's like, I'm like, what the hell? And I love how this almost has no dialogue with the no by Obi-Wan because Qui-Gon does eventually die. But with no dialogue, it's all visual storytelling. I mean, this scene is just awesome. But Qui-Gon does eventually die, sad face emoji. And, and Obi-Wan squares off with, with Darth Maul. And this was just great. I've heard a lot of complaints over the years about how the lightsaber fights in this is just basically all parkour nonsense. There's no story being told. It's just people doing flips and stuff. It's the same argument in pro wrestling. It's just, it's just the flippy shit and the super kicks. But the, the flips and stuff in Star Wars really... It's, it's fine, you know, because... The Jedi were more trained there at that point than ever. They knew all the skills. They knew what they were doing. They were basically using the Force to their advantage. And they and Obi-Wan and Darth Maul were pretty much on the same level in terms of skill level. So they were all basically just... It was basically two hosses looking for a fight. And it doesn't matter if they were flipping or kicking each other. It was still going they were still going for the kill it just doesn't matter if it's like just one blow every like two minutes or so it's like do 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 and then flipping to get out of the way and then another blow or something like that in that regard it still looked really cool all the action was filmed on camera you know ray park pretty much did all the stunts i mean this action scene is really cool but you know what happens next darth maul gets sliced in half and is sent down the chute and that's pretty much the end of the movie. Anakin becomes a Padawan. Yoda warns him about the future, but Obi-Wan is like, all right, I'll take my chances. The Naboo form an alliance. The Gungan King goes, peace! And that's the end. This may be one of the longest reviews I have ever done, but I think it is necessary because to, in order to show that I actually really like episode one, I needed to describe everything just in as much detail as I possibly could. I'm going to give this movie a good rating. I don't think that it's worthy of a great because, you know, of the Jar Jar stuff and of some of the CGI and some of the politics can be a little on the boring side, but at the same time, everything does kind of have a purpose with the exception of Jar Jar. Like, everything kind of moves forward. Like, everything is there, at least for some reason, if not to entertain, but to tell a story. Do I think The Phantom Menace is a perfect movie? Not in the slightest. But do I think that it has a lot of good stuff? Absolutely. And in the end, I think that episode one has a lot of good stuff in it and some bad stuff in it. I agree with the people who hate it. I agree with the people who love it. I'm kind of in the love it to the middle of the road camp. But that's all for me, guys. Thank you so much for watching. Stay tuned for my review of episode two, which should be coming out in a couple of weeks. But if you like this video, please be sure to leave a like. And if you want to subscribe, click somewhere around here. My name is Ryan Cam. I'll see you in the next one. And may the fourth be with you.